Um, to our Summer Wildlife Lecture Series. My name is Kelly. I am the Director of Environmental Education for the Mercer County Park Commission. Uh, this is our first installment of our Summer Lecture Series. Pollinators are in the spotlight tonight. This uh, program is a partner program between the Mercer County Park Commission, the Conserve Wildlife Foundation of New Jersey, and the Wildlife Center Friends with generous support from PSE and G. We are gonna be focusing on pollinators tonight, as I mentioned, how they're crucial to our environment, our food system, um, and even our economy with some simple steps that you can take to protect them in your own backyard because they do need our help. We're gonna take questions and answers at the end but if something pops into your mind while we're doing the presentation, then please go ahead and type it in at our, on the Q&A feature. So if you're looking at your screen, if you scroll on the bottom, you should see um, three dots on the bottom. If you click on that, you should be able to pull up a, a screen that says Q&A. You can just type your questions in there and it's a really easy way for us to, um, to uh, track those questions. All right, so I would like to go ahead and introduce our guests. Um, today we have with us David Wheeler, who is the Executive Director for the Conserve Wildlife Foundation of New Jersey. And we also have Blaine Rothauser, who is a conservation biologist. He is a senior ecologist for, for GZA, uh, Environmental. So um, with that, hoping that we still have Blaine here. Um, Blaine, can you hear us? We'll go ahead and um, hand it over to you both. Yeah, I see Blaine is, let me see here. I'm here, can you hear me? Yeah, sometimes it looks you like your I can um, hear you. screen yep. is frozen. Okay, well, yes. uh, as long Blaine, as you can, can hear you me, we can get started. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, my screen is, is shared. You can't see my screen? I can see your screen. I can see your screen. Okay, go ahead, Dave. Take it over. All right. Okay, well, thank you, uh, everybody, for your patience. Um, we, uh, I think we've all learned that we have an abundance of patience over the last two months, uh, stores of patience we never <laughs> knew we had. Um, and so uh, I do thank you for bearing with us uh, tonight. Um, you, uh, you will be glad you did because uh, I can tell you, before I just get into my brief remarks, I can tell you the, uh, the photos coming up, even if, even if you know, we freeze up at, from time to time speaking, you don't need to see us, you need to see the photos that will be coming up when Blaine gets into uh, some of the pollinators, really incredible. Um, but to just give you a quick uh, context for tonight, uh, my organization, Conserve Wildlife Foundation of New Jersey, we're a nonprofit that for the last 20 years has worked to protect rare wildlife in New Jersey and beyond. And uh, if you could advance to the next slide, if, if uh, any of you have seen bald eagles and ospreys and peregrine falcons, they are some of the signature species that our biologists have worked to protect across New Jersey. Uh, that's such a huge part of what we do is protecting wildlife like that. Um, and those, those species are, are kind of those grand charismatic species that are easy to get people's attention. Um, conversely, there's a whole nother group of species. 80% uh, of all animal species are insects. And yes, they're easy to overlook. In some cases, they may get on our nerves a bit, uh, but in other cases, they're absolutely stunning. And, and in all cases, they play huge roles in our ecosystem and much more than that. For our organization, Conserve Wildlife Foundation, we look at the ecology and how wildlife, and really trying to help the most at-risk wildlife survive. And to give you one example, the Endangered Species Act, there's been 1,600 plus uh, species listed over the, over the last uh, three and a half decades on, uh, with endangered or, or, or threatened status nationally. Uh, until just a couple years ago, there were no bumblebees on that list at all. Finally, in 2017, the rusty patch bumblebee was added to the endangered list federally. And this is a species that a few decades ago, any of us could have seen in New Jersey. We had it here. Um, 
And then little by little through habitat loss, through climate change, through disease and, and invasive species and especially pesticides, all of those combined, we've, lose, we've uh, lost uh, our populations of rusty patch bumblebee to it's had a 90% decline. It's completely gone from the Northeast now. You only can find it in pockets in the Midwest. And it has something like 0.1% of its original range that's still intact. And that's one example of among many. Uh, it, but the fact that it was listed as, a, as an endangered species means finally, after all these years, we're starting to see pollinators like, the, like bumblebees, butterflies, moths, beetles, start to get uh, some attention um, that they desperately need, uh, not just because of the decline, but because of the, the impacts they have on, on the world around them. And, and I'll give you a few examples. Um, these species that, that you know, for, for people, uh, they, their importance is incredible, which I'm gonna come to in a moment, but, but even ecologically, uh, species like um, uh, so many varieties of, of bumblebees, uh, of butterflies, <laughs> moths, they're declining incredibly rapidly. Uh, we've seen uh, butterflies and moths are around 40% uh, uh, decline uh, of the species now are declining. Bumblebees, more than a third of species of bees are declining. Uh, beetles, over 60% of beetle species worldwide are in decline right now. And what, what this means ecologically is, is huge. These are, these are uh, groups of species that uh, pollinate um, roughly three quarters of flowering plants. Uh, they're species that play a, an intricate part in the food web. Um, something like 90% of birds eat insects at one point or another in their lives. And, and pollinators make up a huge part of that diet as part of that, that food chain. Um, for people, the, the, the importance they have is, is mind boggling. Our food systems would be nothing without pollinators. Literally one out of three bites of everything we eat which Blaine's gonna go into much more detail on a lot of this as we go forward tonight. But one out of every three bites of food we eat is thanks to a pollinator. When you have breakfast tomorrow and, and you're having your cup of coffee and, and we'll, we'll go with a healthy breakfast uh, tomorrow. Let's say you're having berries and, and, uh, and, and some other healthy fruits. They're, those are probably due to a pollinator. Even the, the, the meat, if you have bacon or sausage or, or you have um, milk with your cereal in the morning, Th those are due to pollinators because alfalfa and, and other grains are what pollinators make possible, which ultimately feeds our livestock. Uh, so, so the food we eat, um, our health, our, our health is in incredibly tied in, our, our economy, uh, billions of dollars in services are provided free of charge every year by pollinators, and which make in turn make possible many tens of billions of dollars in crops for our economy. Again, without if, pollen, if we were to lose pollinators and continue to lose them at the rate we're losing them, we'd be in a heap of trouble economically and in our food systems. And then ultimately, it, let's also just step back, even if you put those aside, uh, these little critters that are easy to overlook, when you think about what their importance is to our day-to-day -day lives, think about in the last couple of months in particular, how good it has felt uh, for some of us who are, are planting gardens, Others who just have the privilege, you're, you're going out, getting your, your walk to, to clear your mind and to, to walk past some flowering uh, shrubs or, 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 or trees or, or bushes. Um, the pollinator work is what makes that all possible. Can you imagine our art and our inspiration over the centuries had we not had things like Monet's water lilies? It would be incredible to think without still lives and, and everything else that has influenced art and every kind of art form humans have ever invented uh, is in intimately tied in to pollinators and their handiwork. And uh, so, so with that, I, I, I just encourage you to really sit back and, and uh, savor these incredible looks that, that Blaine is going to present uh, over the next hour or so. And uh, I'm privileged to introduce Blaine because not only is he an incredible ecologist who has really uh, lived as up close and personal with these pollinators, as, as you can imagine, but he has the photos that really bring us into this uh, close-up view that would literally be hard to imagine otherwise. So with that, thank you so much to Mercer County Parks and uh, PSCNG for making this series possible, and thank you, Kelly. Thanks, Dave. That was, uh, that was a great 
introduction. I loved it. Um, always like your introduction. And also, let's plug the Pollinators and Peril blog that's on the Conserve Wildlife website as well. Um, Dave produces, um, uh, I think it's almost monthly, a, um, a podcast that, uh, that really gives a great perspective on the incredible work that Conserve Wildlife does. The ecologists, the biologists that get involved in these unique non-game species projects uh, all over the state and uh, the importance to uh, our state's natural heritage. And they're done really well. And I was fortunate enough to be asked to do one on uh, pollinators. So I suggest as a follow-up, you, you listen to that pollinators and feral. Dave does a tremendous job uh, narrating. He's got the perfect voice to, uh, to weave in and out of the, the podcast. I, I, I love the way he, he does it. Anyway, um, pollination, man, this is the fabric of our lives. There's nothing that you're doing today or yesterday or tomorrow that doesn't have some little bug, some what what you most people look at as worthless hexapods, right? Just put here on earth to, to chew our clothes and, and destroy our gardens. Well, I got I got news for all of you that that ain't the case. We have a situation on planet Earth where behind the scenes, 24-7, 365, the bugs are working for us and working for the, uh, working as substitutes for sex for all of the plants. The plants are the laziest sexual beings on, on, in the universe. They, they don't wanna do any heavy lifting. They let the bugs transfer what amounts to be their sperm, right? To the, in the form of pollen, to another plant to fertilize it, pretty cool stuff. But whether you're wearing a sweater today or you ate a banana, as, as Dave said, one out of three bites has some pollinator associated with it. We'll get into that. But uh, let's meet Gramaya Virgo, right? The virgin tiger moth. Man, are you kidding me? Look at how this thing is molded and scripted and created by creations, uh, uh, the creator's skilled hands. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. But besides being incredibly, you know, avatarian, uh, for lack of a better word, they, they do free heavy lifting for us all day, all night long, right? And this is a, this is a moth. I didn't say moss, M-O-S-S, M-O-T-A. This is a moth, right, that's found as larvae in most of your backyards and in your lawns. Um, you know, it's a, it's, it's one of the not two, it's kind of, it's in the cutworm family, but, uh, as an adult, uh, as it emerges, it's doing passive pollination as it lands on different, uh, plants. And, if, and there's nocturnal plants that bloom that these guys can help in the form of pollination. So the beauty in the, uh, heavy lifting is all around us. Everybody knows the counterpart in the Lepidoptera uh, order, right, the butterflies. And we can all relate to this as we see uh, eastern swallowtails at the canopy of forest today. I was watching them both up top. I was at a swamp at six in the morning in Rockaway called Sasso's, Sasso's Swamp. And I was watching um, swallowtails go from the canopy and the tulip trees right? Because tulip trees are starting to go into inflorescence. And um, these guys are uh, one of the main pollinators of that particular tree. And then I see it down on the ground mineralizing in a mud puddle. So, you know, you talk about sweeping through and performing all sorts of ecological functionality uh, all day long. And, you know, these are things that are incredibly beautiful. We just pass them by and say, ah, what's the big deal? But um, if anybody's had uh, tulipo or tulip tree honey, um, some honeybees are, are hybridized just to feed on certain types of plants. And, and uh, the tulip tree honey somehow, to me, tastes, tastes the best when you can find it. But, you know, the pollinators are gilded in golden robes and 
adorned in, in, uh, in regalia that you have to look at closely with a macro lens. I use a, um, a macro system to get some of these close-up images. Uh, but the, what was once a bug from you know, six and a half feet looking down at two inches becomes a, uh, a visual spectacle, right? Be spangled in nature's artistry. There's no other way to put it. And they're all just out there dining on honeydew and drinking the milk of paradise, right? They're, they're there doing their thing. Um, you, can, you can bring all sorts of poetry into motion with these guys that are, that are bizarre. Some just are completely alien and, and rival that of uh, any Star Wars character like this uh, Alfly here. Um, and most of them you just pass by, right? You don't even realize they're there. They're, they're cryptic. They, you, know, you have to like peel back the onion if you really want to see a new universe, the, the cryptic world in which they reside. Um, some are there, but they just blend in, right? Uh, the, the ant guild, which there are in New Jersey, over 64 species of ants here in New Jersey, and uh, they're all working hard on, on native uh, florets, um, like this vetch. You just have to get down and look. That's the problem with people, right? We don't look. We just go through the through the forests on, on these trails, and ah, we're not, you know, no one wants to just stop, get down on their knees, and actually look at things up close. Um, I was laying down trying to photograph a, a water snake today at eye level, but when I'm on the earth floor and I'm looking down, I'm like seeing all all the little micro. Uh, you know, pseudoscorpions in the leaf litter today, you know, breaking down the detritus and, and fertilizing the, uh, the plants that the pollinators are, are going to get their energetics from. All this life um, engine work is there to see if you actually uh, put your naturalistic skills to the test. But man, just take any meadow in late summer and if it's got some floristic variety to it, it's gonna have insect diversity. And I'm telling you people, it is a wonderland of, of, of visual pleasures. Uh, if you just like cool looking things, you know, uh, like this bee fly on, on an early spring ephemeral called uh, Dutchman's Breaches. This is in Jenny Jump State Forest. And these little, uh, these, this is a fly, you know, might look like, like a bee, you know, it's trying to mimic, I guess, a a bee, um, but it's actually a fly that's a major pollinator, obviously, to, to that plant. But you know the commonality of, of insects that are out there. You see them all, but they're all doing, doing a, their part to make sure that the floristic quality of our woodlands is as high as it can be. Some are just passive pollinators, right? The katydids, for instance, they just find, you know, they're all over the place and they're just walking on everything and they're chewing mainly uh, deciduous leaf uh, before they go into their egg laying mode, but they end up in fields and meadows uh, and they are taking some of the florets or eating some of their um, pollinating sources, but they're passively walking from one plant to the other in pollinating that way. You know, you have active pollinators like, uh, like the Carner Blue Federally Endangered Butterfly, which I had the opportunity as an oncologist to work on last year doing surveys up in the Albany pine bush. But here's a, a federally endangered species that needs lupin to fulfill its life history. So lupin is in abundance. If, and if no one has ever went the equivalent of our pine barrens up in, in the Albany region of New York State at this time, it's a, it's a sea of blue. It's a visual uh, spectacle and, and it's got to be seen. And the Carner Blue is relatively stable and, uh, and locally abundant. So you can see this little uh, gemstone flitting away. But uh, 
and it and it pollinates not just the lupin, but it pollinates a number of uh, uh, of species that are not uh, in that are that are in decline more or less. Some common species, but some species that are definitely in decline. So they you know they need each other. We things have evolved together. I'll get into the red queen effect and how that works and how we're disrupting that in a moment. But um, I just want to base your visual cortex in some of these pollinators like uh, mega child here, uh, leaf cutter bee that's uh, pollinating, that's actively pollinating um, uh, Festula. But beetles, like J Dave alluded to, beetles make up the, the largest proportion of biomass on the planet. They're the biggest uh, order of any of any animal on earth and of course they are both active in passive pollinators like that blister beetle and some kind of mimic beetles like this uh, grape leaf skeletonizer when his wings close he almost he kind of looks be more beetle like but with his wings open pollinating white milkweed a very uh, uh, very uh, r much rarer species than a common milkweed that we see and nothing's better than getting in the getting in the uh, water and photographing these things up close and personal uh, photo it, the, the the way that i've learned the these insects in these groups and believe me i'm still learning uh the, the there is a book i just picked it up last year on flies of the northeast it's this thick and I am telling you, it's like maddening to just get a species down to its, its family, let alone its genus, and let alone, if you're lucky enough to have enough detail, its species. But get in the water, walk, walk the edges in the, in the muddy shoals of the wading river, and you don't have to do, um, you know, there's no, no more doing drugs, right? I stopped all the drugs in the 70s when I picked up my camera and started looking at insects. I didn't have to, you know, I didn't have to do it anymore. I was in a psychedelic six pack every day, you know, galumphing through the, wading through the wading river with a, with a camera because, you know, it, it's just, it's, it's just never ending the things that, the beauty that you see on every little flower head, you know, whether it be a flower beetle here in the foreground, our yellow front of bumblebee. Yeah, the bumblebees are in decline. We'll talk about decline soon. Here's uh, uh, an eastern uh, swallowtail on lupin. That was up in it. And of course, with all the the uh, the insect beauty comes the the predators that are out there trying to keep things in balance, like barn swallows and uh, you know gray tree frogs, like. This guy hanging off of, you ready? Come on. Somebody's gotta tell me what that is. Oh, you can't because you're muted. So I'll tell you. This is a uh, wild blueberry here. And that is uh, a beautiful gray tree frog that's just starting to call in every uh, little patch of wetland in throughout the state. But man, nothing, I mean, I can guarantee you ate something today that without the pollinator tethered to it, you wouldn't have had a bite of a piece of chocolate, little midge, tiny little midge, like less, smaller than a pinky nail um, is responsible for your chocolate, right? Coffee, who didn't have a cup of coffee today, right? That was, that was, uh, um, I think that is, I know I should have that at the top of my head. I believe it is a midge as well. But I'll tell you what, almonds, honeybees, right? There's not enough honeybees, unfortunately. Honeybees have had um, collapse syndromes that have decimated certain uh, parts of the country. They're coming back from what I understand. Uh, but a mite out in California has taken out a lot of the larvae, it gets in the larvae and drills a hole through the through the larvae and, um, and uh, actually uh, does severe damage to the hives. But that's why you have to have apiists that bring in hives to the fields to make up um, for it, or else you wouldn't be eating almonds every day. 
like I do for my fiber intake. Okay, so insects and other animal pollinators are vital too. You can't just say it's all insects, it, you know, it's also bats, it's, um, it's, it's mammals, there's certain other mammals that um, are huge pollinators. There's um, white-footed mice pollinate uh, pussy willow. I think I have a picture of that coming up. Um, but look at all of the products that, that we use. And, and it's not just, hey, by the way, if you went into, this, into um, the shop right today and you took out all the products that, um, were that have a pollinator associated with it, um, responsible for, you'd have to cut every shop right in half. You'd have to eliminate 50% of the space. That's how many products. And it's not just, it's not just your food products too. Obviously it's oils, it's medicines. Um, almost 50% of all the medicines in your medicine cabinet have some insect associated with its ex existence. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's a billion, four billion dollar industry worldwide. I mean, we're talking, and, and every time we ask that to somebody, it's a little bit different, but it's in the billions, right? And, um, and we say one out of three bites, I read today, 70% of everything that between fibers, medicines, and foodstuffs, it's like 70% of all of that is responsible to some insects. So all this productivity in agriculture, and, and here, here, look, I, I throw up $30 billion in crops alone. So I see, I see numbers that, that range from it. What did you say today, Dave? You said, um, what did you say leading in? It's basically what I've seen in, in a lot of different sources is, is 4 billion in direct services, but, but basically making crops that are worth Thirty to forty billion dollars. Oh God! Okay. Yeah. God. So again, these numbers are going to get, but but the bottom. I mean, obviously, the bottom line is we owe a debt of gratitude to this guild suite, right? And here's the craziest thing. I just realized this um, in the last week. I don't know how it came about, but oh, that was it. I was watching a documentary on Africanized bees, okay, and how they're you know, sequestered, thank God, to the Southwest uh, in, in, in Florida, Southern Florida. And they're the same, you know, they're just a subspecies of honeybee, um, but obviously a much more aggressive type. But um, during this conversation, it was brought to my attention, and I guess I always realized it, but never uh, announced it publicly, is that this is an invasive species. <laughs> the honeybee is an invasive species. So here is the exception to the rule of invasive species. The, there is no downside to having honeybees in our environment that I've ever seen any ecologist uh, banter in public about. So everything is all the, the benefits in especially pollinating fruit trees um, and giving us obviously honey, but pollinating pears and apples and apricots and cherries. This is, these are the, indeed, the heavy, heavy lifters. Of course, you know, the apples feed the hoof locusts. That might be a downside to, to the whole thing. Um, but um, yeah, that's what I call deer hoof locusts. Um, but they also provide us with lots of, uh, oh, uh, this, this is a good one, 1.5 million metric tons of honey. How do you like that? Goodbye. And then, thank God for this guy, Dr. Morris. I know he died in the 90s, I believe, but he was, um, he, he's been responsible for doing uh, incredible research on honeybees and have uh, helped the ag businesses uh, throughout the world with making sure um, the stewardship of, of honeybees is at its uh, maximum point. Um, so everybody claims this guy is the, the father of, of, um, of agriculture in one respect. Our agriculture owes um, a big debt of gratitude to this guy. 
But you can't forget, you know, weird thing beards, the, the bees. These, this family, the Os, the Osmotidia tidids are um, incredible pollinators of fruit trees, um, and they also do a lot of heavy lifting uh, for agricultural products. And and you can always you always know an Osmid by its uh, this stenopoeic design in its eye. It's got this like zigzaggy uh, eye and um, it's always covered from from the front of the mandibles to the back uh, two-thirds of the abdomen with sete or what we would just say hair but it's really a, a keratinized substance but um, and it's covered with hair on both the ventral and the dorsal side and why is that? It's it's a it's a, a pollen magnet. No matter where it goes in in a plant inside the fruit plant, it's going to get pollen covered all over. Here you see it's obviously pollinating something dorsally, and it's just covered with pollen. Um, oh, here's the uh, uh, here's the guy who's doing um, um, what was the species I just said uh, coffee. This is our coffee. Look at this, this midge, right? Ugliest little thing you'd ever see. And this is, this is magnified quite a bit. Again, this is, a, this is another pinky nail sized critter. But man, you, we should have a picture of this in our kitchen, framed, double matted with UV glass, right? Right above our coffee maker. And we should do one of these every morning to the, to the midge that's responsible for our cup of gel. I don't know. I think, how, how unsung is this critter, right? Think how important this is to our daily lives, and we just dismiss it as an ugly old midge. Okay. Blueberries, you like them on your pancakes? Well, you better like adrenal bees. These guys come out in spring, timed uh, phenologically with the, uh, with, with the opening of, of blueberry uh, florets, the bees come out of their uh, their tunnels from the ground. They're, ma they're mainly the group is mainly um, loose soil tunneling uh, animals, and and you know this timing is is just beautiful. Early spring, the blueberries bloom and the adrenals come out and they do all that heavy lifting, and voila, you got you got blueberries on your pancakes. But man, the array of micro bees that are that are doing all the floristics and in a uh, in a meadow and in your backyard uh, edges and on your trees, they're they come in all varieties and sizes. Now this picture was taken two days ago in the Pine Barrens. This is World Begonia, right? Richard Beck. This is one of the few pictures in this program that's from somebody else took this. He's a colleague of mine at GZA, and he's a wonderful, uh, especially a flower. Uh, photographer. He loves doing rare flowers. And he found this, this um, S2 species, which means there's under 60 populations in the state of this thing, world begonia. But if you look on the uh, leaves, it has these, these hairs, right? And on the uh, floret lip here, right? Uh, you see pollen grains, right? And so when, um, when insects get onto these leaves, they're directed by the setae, always directing them toward the floret. And obviously you gotta be a specific, and I don't know what exact insect does most of the heavy lifting, but when they get in there, this closes on the top and pollen gets on their back and um, it's just a, a, an incredibly unique little system that's, uh, that he captured in perfect photographic detail. If anybody's a photographer out there, this was done by stacking. Um, it's, it's, he took, uh, I believe, 10 images in, and in Photoshop, each image was just a little bit off center, right? So in order to get all this detail in the back and in the front, you had to combine 
all 10 images, each one at a different focal point. And then uh, in combination, you get front to back coverage. That's just a little, little side photography note there. You know, if you take one word away that you want to impress your friends with tomorrow, uh, it's, it's entomophily, right? It's pollination by insects. That's a good 10 penny word for the, uh, for the person who appreciates good food. If it wasn't for entomophily, you wouldn't be eating that almond. That's what I want you to say to your friend tomorrow when he's popping that almond in his mouth. Okay, let me just relax, sit back, have another, have another cranberry pollinate it in the pine barrens by these little micro bees. I'm gonna pop this in my mouth and I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you uh, in on a few cool looking pollinators like this uh, cicada killer, harmless. People would say, get that thing away from me. Uh, you know, how many people would run the other way as fast as they possibly could, like their back was on fire if they saw a cicada killer, right? Completely harmless really doesn't want to sting. It does have a stinger, but you know what? You have to almost squeeze it to get it to sting. I'm not kidding you. I've picked these up. I've put them on it. This cicada killer was in a colony and I wanted it on this Queen Anne's lace. So I picked it up with my hand and I put it on, on there. They were mellow. And, and I put my 100 millimeter macro right up against them and got the picture. Longhorn beetles. You know, Pennsylvania leather wing. Very common uh, midsummer fall uh, pollinator of late season blooming plants. And of course, don't forget, it's not just the adults that are doing it, it's the instars, these intermediate stages, like of, of here, and these are milkweed bugs. And of course, the golden wick digger wasp. I love that, the golden digger wasp. Everybody's afraid of this you know, this killer hornet that's going on out west, you know. And that, that type of stuff just gives the real great insects that are doing all this great work free of charge and uh, a bad name. Think about it. This guy is absolutely gorgeous, right? But as soon as his head fits perfectly within, the, uh, within the, that uh, apical lip of the uh, bee bomb, it just clamps down on him and dumps all that pollen, pollen on its head. A red ant, a uh, beautiful ant on top of yarrow. Uh, don't forget, ants are really cool, right? Anybody who loves spring beauty uh, and trout lily, these, you know, first, second week uh, April blooming things before any leaf out is out, that's why they're spring ephemerals, right? Um, they're pollinated by, um, by ants mainly, right? And the, the big treat is that once they go to fruit, the seeds of these things have what's known as a indusium, nice big fancy word. It's a fatty little tissue on the end of the seed, right? And so the, the ant takes uh, that treat after it's done pollinating, right? I don't know if you're getting some sweet nectar, but it gets this inducive and then it carries it throughout the forest floor. Some get dropped, but some go into their nests, their, their shallow ground nests. And what do they become? Spring beauty next year. Why do you think you got spring beauty everywhere in any uh, good uh, mesic to moist forest? You get, it looks like it's snowed because nothing else is leafed out. And when the spring beauty blooms, you walk through a forest of that and you gotta say, there's a bunch of Hard working ants in this forest. That's what you that's what I think of as a naturalist. People just enjoy it for its beauty, but I'm like, boy, there's a lot of ants doing a lot of good things. But the the the, the smallness of these things, some of these things like this frit fly is like a third of your pinky nail. So look at your pinky nail and cut it into thirds, and that's how small that guy is. Again, uh, the the um, the true Katie dids. Uh, end up passively pollinating. Weird things like like uh, tiger uh, tiger crane flies. Look at this thing. 
mostly nocturnal, but man, I found the, where I found this was on Buttonbush doing a moth survey uh, after midnight. And this guy came to my tarp and then um, flew off when we shook the tarp at the end of the night. And I followed this guy because they're slow flyers. And the first thing he did is land on this whole patch of, of button bush and just walked all over. And I'm like, ah, a pollinator of uh, button bush. And then, of course, you got things eating the, the insects, keeping them in balance. You have to have a scale in nature that's being balanced. You don't want too much of one thing and too little of another. So things like, um, uh, uh, robber flies are help, helping to balance the scales and prairie warblers are taking care of the um, of moth larvae. This is a leaf rolling uh, moth that this prairie warbler is after, right? So you, you get a balance and, and the meadows are truly killing fields. Don't think that it's a pretty world out there, you know? It, it, you know, Thoreau said, man, if, if it's going to be beautiful. I want to squeeze every little ounce of beauty out of it. But man, if it's vicious, if it's deadly, if it's violent, I want to see the violence too. I realize I'm talking in Theruvian language here. I realize that I have, uh, I'm in a situation where it's just reality. You know, we Humans want to make everything poetry in nature, but really there's a lot of vicious killing going on, right? And it's all about balance. Uh, you know, European hornets, he's stinging a red-legged um, a red-legged uh, uh, grasshopper here, um, meadow grasshopper. I followed it around. It was like a, it was like the Serengeti Plains. That's why I really don't need to travel. I really don't. I swear to God, if you're a true hardcore naturalist, ecologist, you don't got it. you don't have to go much farther than your own surroundings to see really cool stuff. Like, you know, people go to Africa and want to see the cheetah jump on the back of the, 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 the Gimsbach, right? Well, following this European hornet around a meadow and watching it hunt and fail so many times before he finally got what he was after. And then when he got it, to see it viciously take apart one wing, then a leg, then the head. He, all he was after was the juicy, meaty abdomen, right? Because at the end of the season, they gotta fill their larders up. They gotta get that last push out at the hive and make sure that the last brood is gonna be all these queens for the next year, that they all have the metabolic uh, potential to make it over winter. So out in these fields, these are killing fields. I mean, no matter where you look, there's death. And um, in the florets of, of almost every other goldenrod floret has a ambush bug. Do you see him? Here he is. He's got this vicious little claw and has small as he is for his uh, size, pound for pound, he can take on, he could claw into the, the meaty abdomen of a bumblebee and then inject a lance-like stylet from underneath his, his head into the um, insect and inject a poison, just like a spider does, right? Injects a poison with enzymatic activity and to just dump it all into its its system and liquefy it and then suck it up uh, with that straw-like uh, adaptation. And then when you walk through a meadow the next day, you're seeing carcasses. If you look closely, you'll see bee, you're like, oh, that bee's not moving. Yeah, he ain't moving. He ain't never gonna move. He's dead, right? And that's because the ambush bugs are out there in, in, uh, in mass. And again, this is a common insect and this is, this is uh, all about making sure that that meadow maintains kind of a homeostatic uh, condition, right? You need these elements in the environment. To me, that's the true beauty is understanding that not only the little thin film of biosphere that we live and breathe on as the only 
organisms we know that exist in the entire universe, right? To me, the beauty is that that's, that little film is in such incredible balance if we, if we don't perturbate it, if we don't disturb it as uh, bipedal uh, time bombs in the system. That's what I call ourselves. We're these, we're these uh, disruptors, right? We're the ultimate invasive species. If we can just let it be, it finds its own level. And that to me is the, the ultimate beauty. Yeah, there's a lot of death going on in that system, but it's a, it's a beautiful thing in totality. Boy, I got off on a tangent there, didn't I, Dave? Uh, okay, so yeah, and I guess praying mantis bring this out the most, and everybody's like, oh, how could you show something like that? That's terrible, that's a monarch butterfly, oh my God, like I said, like, like Thoreau said, if it's, if it's vicious, I want to see it's, listen, to me, this is viciously beautiful. There's the ultimate oxymoron, right? That's viciously beautiful, if you ask me. Ah, the, the robber flies, though, this is such a common bug. Anybody who walks through a meadow tomorrow should be looking for them. They're there. They're there. They hang at the edges of of stems, they're silent hunters. And again, they're ambush hunters. And they're out keeping the pollinators like tachnid flies in balance, right? Uh, marburated stink bugs, these, these are the guys that are, that are taking them out, right? But again, unfortunately, this like um, the leopard slug and the Japanese wineberry and the oriental bittersweet are here to stay, I'm afraid. You know, matter of fact, the, the marmorated, which, by the way, head on, have you ever thought that a, that stink bug has so much going on um, from a, you know, a, a, a uh, is this beautifully ugly to people? I think it is. I think it's, I just think it's intense looking head on. I mean, I never knew it had so much color until I put a macro lens on it head on. But this, these guys have out competed our native uh, stink bugs, which are many different species of green stink bugs in our environment. But like I said, um, the variety, the beauty of wasps, there's thread-waisted wasps and, and uh, wasps that are host specific to only one plant, wasps that can pollinate dozens of plants. Flies do a lot of heavy lifting like this apple maggot fly. Um, in, uh, here's Aristalis. Uh, this is near Nork Bay. I'm going to end my program with a restoration project we, we did in, in, uh, in one of the most unlikely places. But we brought back a whole system of pollinators. And here's one of, of the new denizens of a, of a newly created meadow. Ah, there's the robber fly taken out of Polistus wasps. Now, you might be happy to see that, right? People who have eaves and have gotten stung by those paper wasps underneath your, your eaves, will be happy to create habitat in their backyard instead of the green smear, right? You know, everybody's planting grass. I call it the green smear. And, uh, you know, instead of having that crap in your backyard, plant a meadow and then bring back life to your surroundings. and. Believe me, it'll be a place to defragment your hard drive, a place to go and, and, uh, and look at, instead of looking at uh, Game Boys, right? Uh, your kids are, are constantly playing these stupid games. You want to see real life, you know, life and death tragedies and, and success stories going on? Plant a meadow in your backyard and start looking. It's amazing what you see. Ah. Oh. You talk about evolution at its highest levels. Look at, need you go further than this robber fly. This is a fly, not a bumblebee. But talk about uh, mimicry. And here he is eating a, a plant hopper, right? Another pollinator. They're both really pollinators. Remember, passively, the robber flies, the, the plant hoppers, are all walking over florets in our environment, and they're all being balanced by these really cool critters. Everything you saw so far today, I photographed in New Jersey, so I want to make that point. What makes a good pollinator? you got to be highly mobile, right? you got to be able to, to fly from, from uh, 
plant to plant pretty easily. You've got to be able to have apparati on your uh, body to collect uh, pollen. So whether that be hairs, feathers, scales, you need that in order to bring that sperm from one plant to the other. You have to have, you could have adaptive features like uh, bumblebees have baskets, pollen baskets, little, little um, concave, um, you know, uh, depressions in their tibia that through just going from plant to plant gets stuffed down in there. You've seen it. I think I have a couple of good pictures of pollen baskets. Um, you need to have a lot of energetics, right? So that's what the, the nectar is giving, the, the fueling the tanks, the, you know, to, so that you can do even more and more uh, pollination. But don't forget the animals. Oh, here's the, uh, the white-footed mouse, you know, look at all that pollen of pussy willow on its uh, lower jaw. Incredible, right? And everybody's seen uh, ruby-throated hummingbirds, nectaring on things like cardinal flower. Dragonflies are always landing on different plants and, and uh, in patrolling and then landing on another plant or landing on the same plant, passively pollinating. Of course, bats, anybody who loves bananas has to like bats. If you like to look at uh, pictures of saguaro cactus out in the Southwest, you gotta like bats. Um, Food web support, right? I mean, the whole food web's predicated on on uh, these lower level what what ecologists call the um, the heterotrophs. So you got the autotrophs that are taking the light from the sun and photosynthesizing and then passing it up the food chain. So you know the green snake has gotten its energy really from little tiny insects, inevitably when. Um, a, say a, uh, a, a bird, a small warbler eats the, the insects and then the green snake happens to, to catch a, uh, a warbler unaware. These green snakes blend in perfectly with deciduous foliage. So crazy, crazy food web connections are all predicated on uh, pollinators. So, and if you're out there enough, you see, you see it, you see how energy is going from one uh, food chain rung to the next. Like this red-eyed vireo eating an elm spanworm moth. How do I know it's an elm spanworm moth? Well, there's not too many moths with a, a, a lime green proboscis. And the balancing of the scales done by things like fire researcher. Who would ever think that Something so tropical looking is exists in almost everybody's backyard. When you see it for the first time, you're like, what what it just come in some type of type of packaging? I ordered something from Amazon and in the in the packaging, this thing came from some faraway uh, country and escaped. No, this is this is New Jersey fauna right here. Um, incredible. And you know what the, the fire is another name for it is slug hunter. Slug hunters eat slugs, obviously, but they, and another favorite prey is caterpillars, especially monarch, uh, monarch especially um, uh, the gypsy moth caterpillar. So these guys have done very well in areas of gypsy moth infestation, but they not in enough abundance to balance the scales and have an impact. So pollinators like chaos, right? If you want to create pollinator habitat, just start letting your backyard grow, plant some native plants, cut your brush back, make leaf piles, make brush piles. Brush piles are especially great for pollinators because a lot of the wasps especially will take decaying branches and bore uh, holes to, to pack their larvae through a, with food like spiders and other pollinators and pack it in there and um, then the, the eggs when they hatch have something to eat so so dead wood in, in brush piles are very beneficial chaos nature abhors uh, you know a monoculture a homogenous uh, system it loves stochastic 
big ecological wor word that we love to banter about. We love things that are, we love to mix it up. If you're a uh, re restoration practitioner like myself, you think about chaos. You don't think about English gardens. You think about having nature be really sporadic and really as dense as you can get it, right? Because in this scenario, you get all the ingredients magnetized to your, uh, to your backyard and they all fight each other, right? They're constantly banging heads and button heads, right? If that wasn't the case, you wouldn't have such speciation and variety. It, the red queen effect is this evolutionary hypothesis, which is a process that species constantly have to adapt, evolve, and pit themselves against each other. They like stay in, in place, right? That was the, the whole uh, concept in the fairy book story where the queen and, uh, and um, what's her name? D help me out, uh, Dave. What was the queen fighting in, uh, in Through the Looking Glass? Everybody out there spit it out. So, but they, they were constantly banging heads with one another. Well, that's what's going on here in nature, right? When the Marthesis moth is larvae can handle the oils in poison ivy, right? And that's in and parts to the adult. When it gets to the adult stage, the adult is now like uh, completely protected from predators. No one's going to eat anything that has that same oil in it, right? But they this evolved because slowly but surely, as the as the uh, poison ivy was defending itself chemically, it was chemical warfare. The larvae of this moth. And it was right there at the beginning of this process, and they kept punching at each other. And other species didn't get involved in this battle, but these two did. And, went, and at the end, as you see it today, you see a species that can handle that plant. You see the, the plant itself now completely protected against most everything else. Nobody's, nothing else is chewing on, on poison ivy leaves because it's evolved this chemical warfare with the insect. There's another moss species too, Ipectus, can, can uh, handle poison ivy the same way. So the, and, and it just by happenstance, not by happenstance directly, the two species, the Marathysis moth and the Ipectus are in the same genera. Imagine that. Cool stuff. And this is all for the take it. And thank God, by the way, I always, I always make sure when I talk about poison ivy, one, it's beautiful in the fall. Nothing more beautiful becomes this chrisman uh, encasement on trees, right? Uh, but more than that, it's got the most nutritious berry. If you're a neotropical bird, like a black-throated blue, and you're coming and you got to refuel your tanks to get back to South America, you want to be eating nothing but poison ivy berries, which don't have the, the chemical in it, obviously. And then uh, rather than multiflora rose, which is an invasive species that doesn't have the nutrient density that's even close to the poison ivy. Now, now, am I saying plant poison ivy on your front step? No. But I'm saying if it's around your uh, periphery of your house on climbing up trees where you're not anywhere near, let it be. You know, everybody wants to just nuke it. You know, nuke it out of existence when you don't understand that this is a incredibly important component of forest systems. Okay, that's my my quick commercial on poison ivy. I bet you didn't expect that tonight, right? Um, because you know, if you don't think this way, you end up with homogenous systems like you know. Uh, uh, woodlands that we see all too often with with uh, red fox, a non-native species brought in by the aristocracy um, to entertain, uh, you know, people on horseback. Oh, let me go out on a Friday afternoon and, and chase down a, a fox and torture it with, you know, a hundred uh, beagles and, and, you know, make it crawl down the hall before I frickin' whack it with a, with a uh, high-speed lead injection. That's fun, right? Uh, but anyway, you know, we get all the, 
we, we brought in all these invasive species, garlic mustard, oriental bittersweet, Japanese knotweed, Japanese maple. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Today, this morning, you know, I was out uh, very early and I was thinking about woodlands as I'm walking through. I'm like, man, I'm not seeing a, uh, enough pollinating sources, right? Um, it was, I was hard pressed to come across this little patch of golden ragwort, right? And as I did, I went up to it and I looked closely at it, right? And I had a stare for a while in this patch. I'm like, where's the pollinators? But within a few minutes, you know, there's a, uh, there's a, a carpenter bee and here's a, um, a, another bee fly. I know what genus he's in, but I don't know the species. I got to use my new guide to the flies of the Northeast to, to but, it, but you'll see these common black and white, like uh, you know, they, they almost look like um, yellow jacket mimics, right? But they were pollinating the heck out of golden ragwort this morning, which is a wet wind plant. So that was kind of magical to uh, spend a little time amongst them. But you know, some, some species just without one particular species are doomed, like Pickering's morning glory relies on this thread wasted wasp and mud dubber family, right? Uh, to survive. Bottle gentian um, relies on uh, the blackberry looper. Here's the larvae that somehow glues these little pieces of of plant matter on its back and they become invisible. But there's a relationship between that gentian and that moth. So, you, you know, over time you get these uh, very tightly bound um, pollinator specific relationships. Here's one of my favorite pollinators that I see um, many within the genus agri agristemon, right? Long word. It's a metallic bee, gorgeous, you know? And here it is on orange milkweed. That's a nice combination right there. Here's a, uh, one of the bombuses. Hard to, you know, you have to be pretty expert to quickly identify species of bombus. Here's, a, here's one on, uh, and I just suspect this is a European um, bumblebee, and he's pollinating turtlehead, another, um, wetland uh, oriented, not always in wetlands, but a wetland uh, plant. Ah, if that doesn't scream the topic, I don't know what does, right? <laughs> I, I remember this day because every bumblebee in this patch of, of jewel weed, that's what this is, an impatience, right? Had their backs just completely doused in pollen, it was amazing. And again, you get this very tightly wound relationship, the, the long proboscis here of a skipper that can really get down into the, the nectaries of the plant. The hummingbird moth is great at this too, right? A lot of moth species, a uh, lot of the sphinx moths, uh, pollinate at night, like evening primrose, um, and uh, in flocks, flocks that bloom at night are pollinated by sphinx moths. Here's another mega child uh, uh, pollinating New York ironweed. So we can do a lot to help, right? We, they, as Dave said, hey, listen, uh, Barack Obama passed a, um, a memorandum, one of his last executive orders to uh, to create a, um, a, a value to the pollinating community, um, you know, that has done a lot of great uh, rollbacks on the use of pesticides, um, which is one of the reasons why our monarchs are in such a severe decline, especially in the Midwest. We just overuse pesticides like crazy, you know, and Barack uh, had the forethought um, to, to pass some legislation that has uh, banned a lot of the, the broad scale 
um, pesticides. So uh, that's helped the pollinators. But certainly, you and I can help by creating backyard habitat. Put maybe a quarter of your, think, consider putting a quarter of your property in meadow. If everybody put just 25% of their green smear into a meadow, the pollinator problem would probably dissipate overnight. Um, and it's really that, that simple. It would be that simple if we just reverse the mentality that green lawn is good looking and meadow is scary. If we flip that on its head, um, the earth would heal pretty quickly. These uh, pollinator uh, uh, homes are, are just little tubes. You know, a lot of it's made from uh, 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 Phragmites, the reed grass. They just cut them up into pieces. They're hollowed out and they stick them in a chamber and it becomes great homes for uh, adrenid bees and other uh, cavity nesting species. Here's the adrenaline here, so important for blueberries. But again, things like uh, weevils that we think are so, you know, you think of cotton, right? The cotton weevil, you know. But m most of your weevils are real uh, specific pollinators, like these guys on blue flag iris. You know, they see in the infrared. So this is like, looks completely different. What looks blue and violet to us. Uh, might look red to them in reality, but there's the landing strip sticks out and it directs them right to the nectaries of the plant. Most of your insects are attracted in this way. So this guy's seeing things completely different uh, than we do. So, you know, plants are just made for different Pollinated, Poll uh, pollinators that can hang upside down and work the nectaries, uh, like this uh, bumblebee. You know, they have these design clasping lace, they're real specific. You see those, um, those, uh, those distal uh, apical arches, they're called, they're, they're there to claw and hang upside down, uh, crazy. I just got something that said my internet's unstable. So I better run through this before I get uh, cut off. But what we have is, is you know, monocultures of things like mugwort. That makes the baby cry. And that, and all this non-native stuff like wineberry and uh, honeysuckle, that really pisses off the, the robin, right? Uh, but thank God for guys like Doug Tallamy, who wrote, who wrote a book, who wrote the Bible to, to change all this nonsense. He's he studied, uh, he studies insect relationships, uh, University of Delaware for entomologists, and wrote the best book in the world that everybody should have in their library that cares about pollinators and, and really biodiversity on planet Earth. If we could all read this simple book, you'd probably start changing things in your landscape, bringing nature home. It's, it's really like the Bible for understanding how important it is to, to rewire, to reconnect um, a uh, ecological computer that is our surroundings, you know. He teaches uh, the average homeowner how to, you know, what to look for, what to get rid of, what to plant, how to create chaos, and why it's so important. Great book, right? Um, so, if, so in my own backyard, this is what it, it looks like. Uh, you have what was once a green smear. It's a escape uh, section. It's a sanctum sanctorum for me to, you know, get away from all the the uh, COVID nineteen and the politics and the and all the nonsense that bogs us down. And uh, it's a place to to commune with. Um, other creatures that, again, free of charge or making sure that every third bite of food that I eat is, um, is stable. You know, we got to fight climate change. This is the, the, the section to the right, the, the map to the right shows what, uh, how the forests are going to change. You're not, you see all the colors in the one on the left? Well, can't read that very well, but it's uh, describing different subtypes of forest, you know, whether they be oak hickory or 
or uh, Aspen Beach or Maple Beach. A lot of color in the one on the left. That means diversity. That means diversity of species, diversity. Of, uh, in the next 50 years, it's projected. This is a university. This is Georgia Tech University um, that does a lot of work with pollination, projecting out into um, 2070 and beyond that our forests are going to change so much, the species richness is going to decline. You can't, they're not going to be able to keep up with it unless we can, you know, keep the temp, the thermostat um, where it is and reduce it if possible. So we all try to do our part. As a, a restoration practitioner, I had the opportunity to convert one of the grossest places historically on planet Earth, North Bay, that's come back with the Clean Air, Clean Water Act and, uh, and help bolster a project that's uh, going on right underneath the 78 Exchange Bridge. You see all that tidal marsh there. Uh, that's all being restored. All that reed grass is going to become a, uh, a marsh grass called Spartina. Bottom line is behind it is a chemical company called Ferminich. Uh, I had a contract and I won't get into the history of why this would happen here, but all this space that you see in one, two, three, and four uh, is clay for me to transform from grass, from green smear, from uh, this one monoculture of reed grass and do some ecological restoration work, which four years ago, we got rid of all the grass, we herbicided it with a systemic herbicide, didn't get into the water, um, killed every last blade of grass, killed every invasive species, killed all of the, destroyed all of the propagule, the fancy way of saying the seed bank. And, um, and then we started to uh, till it. We wanted to create like an English muffin effect so that you'd have a lot of good contact with the seed we were gonna throw down. Anyway, through many, uh, many days of caring from both the folks at Ferminich and my company, the company I work for at GZA, we, um, we had a budget to work with and created an incredible uh, meadow where now there's four acres of meadow where right next to a, a really a, a chemical company that, that makes fragrances, right? Now it's this stopover place for migrating birds. You got, you know, we planted all this mass producing native uh, shrubbery like elderberry. Here you see a, a cat bird that I photographed on site, uh, blessing me, giving me the, the a thank you that holy smokes, along the Atlantic Flyway, I have no place to stop at any Burger King to fuel up. Now I do. Um, and this is the paradigm shift that we're hoping gets into the DNA and the mentality of even places along North Bay, where you think that would be the most unlikely place to plant a garden, so to speak. Um, but here the great, the great, um, the great flycatcher, a uh, great crested flycatcher came by and thanked me. All the migrating birds, it's amazing. When I did a bio index before and after, after five years, it's through the roof, um, you know? And that really concludes my end of it. I'm gonna turn it back to Dave for a few slides and thank you if you all hung in there uh, long enough to hear me just babble on uh, pollinators. Hopefully you enjoyed it. You got something out of it. And uh, I'm going to hand it back over to Kelly and, um, and Dave. Fantastic. Go Thank ahead, you Dave. so much, Glenn. I really appreciate it. Yes. So um, could we advance the slide one, Blaine? So yep. we are, this more. is just the first part of our wildlife lecture series. Yep, one more. Um, our next one will be held on Tuesday this time, June 16th. Our topic will be living with urban coyotes. So if you are interested in that, um, please make sure you register. I just put the registration link in the chat. And also, if you're looking to explore any of these topics with younger children in your life, 
um, then please check out our family nature activities. Um, there you'll find games and activities for younger children that coordinate with these lecture topics. So there's an activity there for uh, pollinators and then you'll see the other ones later in the series too. I just posted that link on the chat. Um, I want to thank uh, PSE and G once again for making this series possible. And um, uh, could you advance one more for me, please? Um, and County Executive Brian Hughes for supporting environmental education, certainly. And also the Conserve Wildlife Foundation and the Wildlife Center Friends. Blaine, if you could advance it one more you'll get a chance to uh, see the web addresses for these wonderful organizations. If you want to learn more about the amazing work they do in New Jersey to help um, native New Jersey wildlife, please check out their websites. Um, and I want to thank you all for coming today. We do have time to take some questions if you would like. There, let's see, where's my Q&A? There were a few questions. Blaine and David, do you want to take a look at the, um, the question bank and um, take a stab at some of them? Yeah, I saw one question earlier, Blaine, that, that you might be able to uh, give some, some better insight into. Um, the question was, was along the lines of before honeybees, since honeybees are invasive, before they got here, what pollinated all the different flowers? So, so is, is it true that hon honeybees are more tied into certain invasive themselves, fruits and, and crops that, that we have, correct? Right. That's the answer to the question. They were brought in with the fruit trees. And, um, you know, uh, so, and again, they, they quickly adapted to native uh, plants as well. I mean, you see honeybees, uh, especially on umbilis uh, um, flowers. So things like queen ants, like things like, um, uh, thistle, so composites, uh, really on anything. Anybody who's walked through a field and looked at flowers sees uh, honeybees, but mainly uh, um, the fruit trees uh, in, in our native choke cherries, our native uh, black cherry. Uh, I mean, again, the, the tulip trees, like I was talking about how some apias somehow get these bees, and I can't answer the question how they get so host specific to certain. You know, you get clover honeybees, you know, clover honey. Um, don't know how that works. I, I defer that to an apius, but um, yeah, no, the, they, I think that the answer to that is they came in the same time the Europeans brought the, the fruit trees, they brought the honeybees. Any other um, questions? One, one other, uh, I know there was another question about, um, it, you know, any recommendations on, on someone putting in a beehive or, or bee box. Is there any way to avoid bees that sting, like for somebody who has young children or grandchildren? Yeah, so when you put those, um, you, did you, you saw the, the infamous, uh, and they sell them now at Agway, at Home Depot, uh, the bee, the bee homes, I don't know what, they have a generic name, I call them bee homes, but they mainly get your uh, harmless um, uh, wasps and uh, in, in families that are not stinging wasps. Now, I caution anybody, when I say non-aggressive, how's that? I mean, if, you, if you're close to one of these uh, box. I mean, I certainly photograph all the time, and I'm not. They fly right in and out and, and above me and beyond. Nothing wants to sting me. They have no desire. It's not a Polistis wasp. Uh, you know the 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 infamous um, wasps of Eves. It's not a bold-faced hornet. It's not a European hornet nest, right? So those are the the. It's not a yellow jacket uh, ground nesting wasp. Anything that's that's going in and out of the ground in mass, stay away from. But that's not what you're attracting with these, with these homes. The ones that you're attracting with these uh, wasp homes are really harmless. Uh, Again, you have to squeeze them, guys, to really get them to sting you. Yeah. 
One other question I saw was uh, um, someone who lets uh, creates basically a leaf pile, some kind of brush pile in their backyard. Um, is there a certain point after the winter is over that it's okay to clean it up and kind of start fresh for the new season? Or you can is it do whatever you want at your house, but here's the gig. <laughs> you want to keep it uh, and make it grow. So the brush piles that we have at, at, on our restoration sites, we just keep cutting brush and, and putting them on top because as it compacts, right, it gets better because it gets um, more refrigerated in the summer. You, you stick a thermometer in a, in a brush pile that's well built and, and very stacked nice, it can be 10 degrees cooler in the summer and 10 degrees warmer in the winter, you know. On, at Furmanich, where we created a tremendous, my, my favorite brush, brush pile, <laughs> never thought I'd say that in a sentence, but my favorite brush pile is this giant that we stacked everything, logs, weeds, and of course branches, a lot of aspen that we took down that was kind of invading the site. We, we compressed and now we keep stacking I'm telling you, I photographed the most incredible migrating birds. Uh, Yellow-breasted chat, right? Song sparrows live in there. That's where all the woodchucks are. That's where all the, um, the small mammals are, the white-footed mice. It's a mecca of life, this, this wood pile. So anybody who creates a wood pile, just keep putting it, blow your leaves onto it, put your branches, but mix it up, put big logs on it. The, the more chaos and the more non-structure to it, the more successful it's going to be as a, a biodiversity magnet. Yeah, and for anyone listening, uh, Blaine is going to be releasing his list of top 10 brush piles in New Jersey. I think <laughs> later, later this month. So, you know, stay tuned. We'll, we'll try to put yeah, that on Conserve Wildlife. <laughs> but uh, actually, one other... Uh, Really good question was asking about the uh, the Furmanich restoration. While that isn't public, uh, that's not something that the public can go to because it is part of a chemical um, a fragrance manufacturer. If um, anybody is really truly interested in seeing that, I do have the opportunity to to take people on tours um, throughout the year. You, uh, Dave's been there many times. Dave, as a matter of fact, Dave is uh, is. Conserve Wildlife has helped out quite a bit at that site because it, it, as Dave and I are, we're very fond of this site. We're fond of the person who uh, runs the, the, the operations there that has really allowed us to, to, to do this. But it's because it's in such a weird place in the landscape of New Jersey. You know, Dave will talk about, you know, pollinator projects on corporate sites in much more bucolic settings, right? In rural settings, but not on North Bay. And that's what makes this so special. Like I said, and I just touch, I do a whole program on Furmanage, right? And the restoration. And Dave will tell you, I have images of incredible, especially birds that have migrated that weren't there four years ago. The nature is, dying to fill these vacuums, you know? It, it's there to repair itself. If we don't let it go too, the pendulum swing too far one way, um, nature will heal itself, you know? Again, uh, I, I love saying in, during my TED talk about the green smear, at the end I say, give nature an inch, it'll take a yard. Sometimes a backyard. You let it go far enough, it'll take the entire landscape, right? So that's really it. It's about snowballing this thing um, and getting people to be better stewards. If anybody can take a lesson away tonight, be a better steward of your backyard. And, and that's what's great with that uh, property. Like you said, I mean, that, that to me is a microcosm of New Jersey as a whole. It's, it's this place that in so many ways was written off ecologically, faced massive challenges all in Newark Bay. And yet, when people get involved and when people take the lead and, and do things like restoring property, planting native, that is what's possible. One thing I would say closer to home in Mercer County for many of the folks watching, uh, a place to see the pollinator gardens would be Mercer County Wildlife Center. Um, I don't know about now during this time, you might know better Kelly, uh, but 
under when things start to reopen again, it's a wonderful place. Not only do you get to see all the incredible uh, birds of prey out there, but you get to see pollinator gardens. Yeah, they're 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 not open to the public just yet, but hopefully, as as things um, open up more and more, the the wildlife center will have a chance to do that. There's also a native plant garden at the Tulpa Hawking Nature Center. Um, so there's some fantastic pollinators that we see uh, every day out there as well. I, I was just going to give you a plug, Kelly, because I've been there <laughs> to just take my <laughs> macro lens. It's tremendous. You've planted yeah. that with such a great floristic variety that it magnetizes all these weird uh, midges, flies, beetles, and, and uh, everything that you can imagine that you saw in this program. You could see out at that meadow. I recommend everybody who wants to learn anything about pollinators. As a matter of fact, I would love to take a, a field group to that particular meadow. That's where I would love, right, Dave? We were talking about this last Absolutely. year. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Maybe later in the summer if, uh, if things are able to open up enough. That would be something we'd love to work with the county on. It's something to look at. Um, there is a, uh, a power line right of way right next door to the nature center there that PSE and G has uh, started uh, managing into a wildflower meadow. And almost immediately after um, installing that, they started seeing all these interesting native bees come back. Um, and it's been really exciting to see that develop over the years. It's still a baby. I think it's just uh, getting into its second year. Um, and every year it just gets better and better. That's great. Build it and they will come. That's right. Right. Oh, yes. And um, Christina mentioned that there is the Mercer Educational Gardens over by the, um, the Mercer Stables. Um, so that's another great place to take a look at some of these plants. And, and you know, you can kind of get a look at some of these plants in action and see if, if they might fit in your, in your native plantings at your house. Um, as Doug Tallamy is, is really promoting, I think, so uh, with so much value is that those, those lawn spaces, our homes, the, that, those are our kingdoms and we have the ability to, to create our own uh, wildlife and pollinator oases. Um, and I think that's probably where a lot of this work is going to need to come from in the future. Mm -hmm. And again, it doesn't, you know, once you spend a little upfront money, you're done. You're not mm -hmm. mowing it anymore. All you're doing is just freaking out on all the incredible stuff you're saying. You know, it's, it's, right. it's really just completely, it's insane that we're, we're such in lust with green smear. I cannot, anybody who wants, now I'm plugging myself, anybody who wants to hear me pontificate about my hatred of grass, Watch the green smear on on um, YouTube. <laughs> Are there any final yeah, questions <laughs> before we wrap up for this evening? All right. Well, I Thanks, thank everyone. you all so much for joining us. Absolutely. David and Blaine, thank you so, so much. I appreciate it. And I wish everyone good luck as you um, search for pollinators in your yards. I wish you good luck as you are seeking out those native plants, hopefully that you'll want to put in there. Thanks for joining us. And we hope to see you again on June 16th for coyotes. Take care, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Goodbye.